morning. I'm very, very happy to be with all of you. And I, I couldn't help thinking, since I am in the middle of talking to students who are eagerly applying for judicial clerkships, how excited they would be to, to, <laughs> to see this room full, room full of judges. <laughs> So, so I am the lawyer on this uh, on on this panel, and and uh, my role in a very few minutes is to set the stage for Bea and and for Larry, who are who are the scientists. And what I what I want to do is to is to is to focus on three things, all very briefly. Uh, one, I wanted to describe the political and legal context for the fascination with neuroscience and its and its relationship to juvenile crime policy in the last decade I want to look a little bit at what the relevance of this uh, of this science uh, might be and then look at some applications and most importantly at the uh, three Supreme Court of the Eighth Amendment opinions in which the court in which the court used uh, uh, used uh, scientific evidence as the basis of its uh, its legal opinion, uh, and finally, uh, to to end with a cautionary note about the limits of the use of science in this in this context. So I think it is fair to say, and there are, I might get some challenge for this, but that but that the area of juvenile crime regulation is one in which there is a broad consensus that neuroscience may have something important uh, to, uh, to offer in, in explaining uh, better than we now understand differences between adolescents uh, and adults, and particularly between adolescent uh, offenders uh, and adults. And there is, a, there is a real fascination with neuroscience and with behavioral science as well. This was not always uh, the case. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, juvenile offenders, you may remember, were described as super predators, uh, a climate of, uh, of something akin to moral panic about juvenile crime prevailed, uh, and, and, and in a series of punitive law reforms, uh, traditional juvenile, juvenile justice policy was pretty much transformed. So straight, states across the country passed laws uh, facilitating the uh, the uh, uh, prosecution and punishment of juveniles as adults, and in the juvenile system, incarceration became much much more uh, much more bri uh, broadly used. <laughs> in the past decade, enthusiasm for harsh punishment uh, of juveniles has waned, and there's been uh, a significant. Uh, uh, questioning of the wisdom of policies that uh, that treat juveniles uh, as uh, as uh, as adults, and there has been a movement toward more moderate policies, as Laurie, Laurie Garduki suggested in in her remarks. Uh, there are several factors that have come together to to influence this change in uh, in attitudes. Probably most importantly, juvenile crime declined beginning in the mid-90s. Uh, Incarceration-based policies turned out to be very expensive, which legislatures realized in, in the midst of a, uh, of a recession. And perhaps just as importantly, uh, the, the effectiveness in terms of crime reduction of the broad use of, of incarceration uh, became, became very, uh, uh, very questionable. So what's happened recently could be described as kind of a re-emergence of the traditional view that juvenile offenders, due to their developmental immaturity, uh, are different from their adult uh, counterparts uh, in ways that are relevant to their criminal offending uh, and that lawmakers should take some serious steps. But today, this view is, is informed by behavioral research and by a growing body of neuroscience research that confirms that the adolescent brain indeed is still a work in progress and suggesting that immature brain structure and functioning uh, contributes to risky teenage uh, behavior and likely to, uh, to uh, criminal behavior. 
Now, there are a lot of ways in which, in which, in which am I doing some responding to this? There are a lot of ways in, in which uh, neuroscience could be, uh, could be relevant to uh, uh, juvenile crime uh, regulation. And I just, I just want to focus on, uh, on two points. Uh, first, the, the evidence that immature brain functioning affects adolescent decision making and risk taking would be relevant to the, to the question of whether, uh, whether the criminal acts of, uh, of teenagers are less culpable than those, uh, those of adults. And, and as, as Sarah suggested, the behavioral research already demonstrates that adolescents are more susceptible to peer influence, more focused on rewards than are adults, uh, that they have less capacity for self-regulation and uh, or for attending to, uh, to future consequences. So if these transient developmental characteristics can be linked to, to brain functioning, uh, it, it will not only provide greater understanding of adolescent decision making, but it strengthens the case for, uh, for uh, more lenient uh, sanctions of, uh, of juvenile offenders than, than, of, uh, than of adults. But there's a, there's a second uh, reason in which this, uh, way in which this research uh, may, be, may be important. And that is that if, if most adolescent offending uh, is the product of, uh, of developmental influences that are grounded uh, in immature brain functioning, then most juvenile offenders have the potential to reform. Uh, and, and if this is so, it supports correctional interventions that attend to adolescents' developmental needs uh, and that maximize the possibility that, that they will reform and become non-criminal uh, adults. So it's not surprising that lawmakers, politicians, and the media uh, have, have, have reached the conclusion that this research potentially could be very important to the way we think about punishing juveniles and to our responses to their uh, to their crimes. Now, the most famous example of, of the use of developmental research uh, in, uh, by, uh, by lawmakers, of course, is in the, the three uh, Supreme Court uh, opinions rejecting harsh sentences uh, for juvenile offenders under the Eighth Amendment prohib prohibition of cruel and un unusual punishment. Uh, Roper against Simmons in 2005 uh, struck down the juvenile death penalty, and, and the court did not, did not talk about neuroscience research, but it relied very heavily on behavioral research in its proportionality analysis and in its conclusion that juvenile offenders were less culpable than adults and seldom uh, and don't deserve uh, the harshest punishment of, uh, of uh, the death penalty. Now, several of the briefs in Roper did uh, uh, emphasize the neuroscience research, uh, and it was discussed in oral arguments, and so it, it may have influenced uh, influenced uh, the court. But in the two more recent Supreme Court decisions, uh, adolescent brain science was front and center. In Graham against Florida in 2010, and last term Miller against uh, Miller against Alabama. The court struck down state laws that either allowed or mandated the sentence of life without parole for uh, for uh, for juveniles. In in finding this this uh, sentence to be excessive punishment uh, for uh, in most cases at least uh, for juveniles, the court emphasized uh, again we we heard this phrase before that this conclusion is not based on what any parent knows, uh, but on science and social science, two different categories according to the court. And it, it went on to note that developments in psychology and brain science show fundamental differences between juvenile and adult minds in parts of the brain involved in behavioral control. 
And based on the scientific evidence, the court concluded, as it had in, in Roper, that juveniles are less culpable uh, than adults, uh, but also uh, that, that juveniles, uh, as it put it, with neurological development, had a greater potential to, uh, to reform. The, the Supreme Court's message has resonated uh, with other, with other uh, lawmakers uh, who have pointed to adolescent brain science uh, to explain their support for, uh, for uh, more lenient sentences uh, and also for, for uh, support for uh, developmental, uh, developmentally based correctional, correctional programs. And I could give you so many examples, but just as one example, uh, the state of Washington uh, excluded, in, in, a, in a statutory reform of, uh, a few years ago, excluded uh, uh, juvenile offenders from mandatory uh, minimum sentences. And in the statute itself, it, uh, it described that the uh, brain science that, that uh, supported the, uh, uh, the reform. Now, a puzzle, and this, is, this has been mentioned uh, before, is that lawmakers and politicians uh, are more impressed with, with the kind of hard science evidence uh, of differences between adolescents and adults uh, than with the large body of behavioral research that is, that is largely uh, merely conformed by the neuroscience evidence that we have uh, at, uh, at this point at least. And I think a, a great example of this uh, was uh, uh, Seth Waxman, who represented Chris Simmons in, in the Supreme Court, and in sort of underscoring a point about adolescent developmental immaturity, uh, Waxman told the justices, I'm not just talking about social science here, but the important neurobiological science. So I think what that suggests at a minimum is the power of neuroscience and the extent to which it, it is deemed important to, uh, uh, to lawmakers and politicians. Uh, even if it may be annoying to developmental psychologists to, to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, that it has so much power. So my final point uh, is, uh, is something that I think is going to come up quite a bit in this, uh, in this conference, and it, and it already has. Uh, the, the research to date has been used to support general conclusions uh, that adolescents as a group are, are generally less mature in their decision-making than adults, uh, and that they, therefore they may deserve less punishment. There was no evidence about, uh, about uh, Graham or Miller's uh, brain functioning. Uh, inevitably, however, uh, attorneys have tried to introduce neuroscience evidence in criminal trials and will continue to do so to demonstrate that the brain functioning of a particular youth uh, was or was not uh, mature enough for him to be held uh, responsible. And to this point, courts have resisted uh, admitting this, this evidence, and, and they should uh, not admit it uh, at this point on, uh, on scientific grounds. The, the neuro research that, that we have now uh, provides group data uh, showing a kind of a developmental trajectory uh, in, in brain structure and, and functioning uh, during adolescence, but it doesn't allow us uh, to move from that group data to, uh, to measure the maturity of any individual uh, adolescent. At some point, there may be uh, uh, behavioral uh, and uh, uh, neuro data that provide age norms against which an individual adolescent's maturity could be measured, but we're, we're not at that point now. So uh, I think Bea is going to, to speak next, and she is going to talk about the developmental neuroscience.